Okay, thanks everyone for, for joining and good evening or good afternoon and good evening. And this webinar is a joint event initiated by Institute for Global Health and Development at PKU and Stanford Water Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center. I'm Yu Hong Pan, the host of today's event and an assistant professor of economics from PKU. So please let me introduce our today's honorable speaker, Ayer Frank. Professor Frank is an assistant, assistant professor at the Harris School of Public Policy and the Energy Policy Institute at the University of Chicago. He works at the intersection of economics and conversation, uh, conservation, addressing three broad questions in this field. So how do natural inputs, namely animals, contribute to different production functions of interest? And how do market dynamics reduce natural habitats and lead to the declining wildlife population levels? And finally, what are the costs, indirect ones in particular, of cons conservation policies? So to overcome causal inference challenges in this uh, regarding these questions um, as like manipulating ecosystems and species at large scales is often infeasible. Professor Frank's works like draw work draw like on natural experiments from ecology and policy and uses econometric techniques to advance our understanding regards this interest field, the social cost of the biodiversity losses. So during this seminar, please feel free to ask questions by unmuting yourself, or you can post questions in the chat box. I also encourage you guys to turn on your cameras during the seminar to enable us a more interactive atmosphere. So without further ado, let's welcome Professor Frank. Thank you very much for that introduction and for the invitation and opportunity to present this joint work with Anand Sudarshan where we take a look at the social costs of losing vultures throughout India. I'm very happy to show you this uh, work today also because we're in the process of making revisions to the paper and where possible and where I remember, I'm also gonna try and tell you this is where the referees had some issues with, this is what we're doing to address that. And I would love to hear your thoughts about like, what else do you think we can do? Whether you think it's you know a good response, satisfactory, any other open threaded questions you might have, feel free at any point to just ask me anything that's unclear or you want me to like delve into more details about. Broadly, I find my this project and a lot of my work motivated by what we hear repeatedly from ecologists that biodiversity levels are in free fall. We are losing species left and right. Extinction rates are a hundred to a thousand times higher than what they think are the normal background levels. And what ecologists are essentially telling us is throughout many different taxonomic groups, we're seeing a decline in abundance. We're seeing a decline in species diversity. We're seeing a decline in the functions that those species have in the ecosystems. And that those declines are not simply going to remain contained within the ecosystem that they can potentially have really large impacts on humanity, on human well-being. What they're telling us is that we should be conserving more, protecting species more, and restoring their population levels, and we should make that a priority. As economists, however, we often ask, well, how do we then prioritize our scarce budgets and conservation resources? Do we simply go and protect the species that are very warm and mega charismatic and fuzzy and you know evoke and inspire us to write such, such poems that could be a winning strategy as long as those species are also the species that are very important in terms of the roles they have in ecosystems that we derive value from. But not all important species in an ecosystem are necessarily charismatic as well with vultures being a prime example of species that do perform a very important function, but do not necessarily uh, have lines of people waiting to hug them. Okay? They're an example of a species or that ecologists think of as a keystone species. They're not necessarily always charismatic, but what ecologists would kind of like define them as, they're a species that when they're lost, 
they can have a very disproportionate effect on the ecosystem relative to their abundance, meaning they don't have to make up a very large share of the biomass in an ecosystem for removing them from the ecosystem, resulting in a really big change. You can think of it as you know going on an airplane, removing one screw after the other, maybe the first 10 don't really do a whole lot or like suddenly your entertainment system doesn't work, but then like you remove the 11th one and there goes the third engine into the ocean, okay? That's kind of like a keystone species. Like you turn off a switch in the system that is very, very important. And I'm just showing you a few photos here of like other species that are considered as keystone species, uh, but don't necessarily, you know, would want anyone would want to keep as a pet uh, or like would, you know, write poems about like they would with the Bengali tiger from the previous slide. What ecologists also tell us is that when we lose such species, the damages can extend well beyond the ecosystem and it can be very costly to either substitute them or try to reverse their loss. So in this paper, we ask the question, how much is human well-being affected by the loss of keystone species? And we studied this in, by focusing on vultures and their role as environmental sanitizers using their abrupt and unexpected decline across the Indian subcontinent. If you've never truly thought or heard too much about vultures until today, you should know that their key role in the ecosystem is to remove dead animals from the environment. And by doing so, they also crowd out other scavenger species like rats and dogs. In India in particular, they have a very special role to play because of the social norms regarding the handling of meat. And unfortunately, in the mid 90s and early 2000s, certain species declined and collapsed entirely due to chemical pollution, on which I will tell you a lot more very shortly. What we do in this paper is we combine data on the habitats of where these vultures were very abundant before the collapse, and we map out how that uh, affected all cause death rates at the district level. So the empirical strategy here is a very simple one. We're thinking of these sudden unexpected die-offs to vultures as a natural experiment and are comparing the places that are very suitable to the places that were not so suitable for the affected vultures and seeing how uh, all-cause human death rates evolved around their collapse. In a triple difference strategy, we're also going to add a layer of livestock agriculture at baseline because vultures are really important where there's a lot of livestock agriculture because they're essentially the sanitation service and waste disposal service that removes all those dead livestock animals. What we find on average is that in the years after vulture populations have collapsed, we see death rates in the high suitability regions about 4% higher than the low suitability uh, districts. And um, kind of like, you know, just to give you a bit of a background on kind of how is it possible that vultures will have such a big effect on sanitation? How can they matter so much to it? It's important to understand that they have evolved to be very good at what they do and very effective at scavenging along evolutionary time scales. You should kind of like a few numbers in mind is that a pack of vultures can descend on a carcass, carcass of a cow and consume it down to the bone in under 40 minutes. They're able to do so safely, okay? I don't recommend that to like anyone else to do, including like other, like potentially other mammalian scavengers. But the reason that they can do so time and time again and not worry about like, bacteria and diseases in that carry-on is that their stomachs are about 100 or 10 to 100 times more acidic than ours. That essentially means that they're like kind of like the final stop for all of these different bacteria and pathogens. I like to colloquially say that like having vultures around is like having bleach getting sprayed on their environment because they're just like this disinfecting agent and uh, getting rid of all the problems that you can imagine would happen with like a large body of rotting uh, dead animals out in the environment. And for many years, 
farmers in India knew all about this and uh, due to the lack of any formal infrastructure to dispose of dead animals, farmers used vultures by bringing out their dead animals out to landfills at the outskirts of the population centers, leaving the dead animals there and waiting for the vultures to come and clean up uh, after the mess. Now, as I told you, just a minute ago, this is very important in India because Hindus will not consume cows and Muslims will only consume animals as long as they're according, killed according to halal. Just to kind of like visualize what this looks like. Yeah, uh, so, so just, yeah go ahead. Yes, just out of interest. So in other regions, in other also poor regions, how people remove the, the carrier. So there will be a... Um, you you mean not in India or not in India? Yeah, not in India. In like oh, in so so they will either and uh, they will either burn them, they will either bury the animals, or um they will leave them um for like other scavengers such as rats and dogs. It's not they're not a perfect substitute, and I'll touch on the reasons as like why they're like you know an inferior technology. If you want to think about them uh, as economists and not as ecologists, um, but like it's it's not that vultures are the only means, like the only ecological biological uh, channel through which uh, dead animals get removed from the environment. They're just a very efficient one, um, at what at what they do. Um, and they don't necessarily come with like some negative side effects, such as having many rats and dogs running around. Um, um, so why not Indian people just burn them? Just because, because it is very labor intensive to burn. I should also, I think, oh, forgot to mention this. Intensive. Um, that we're talking about a country with about 500 million livestock animals. It is a massive sector in, of the economy. Um, I don't know if you can hear the siren in the background. Apologies for that. Um, but yeah. there's just like so many animals and so many animals that you need to get rid of that like burying them or burning them uh, is just prohibitively expensive. And there isn't really sufficient regulation in place to like be able to impose that cost on, on the farmers. Uh, it's a lot easier, even though it's illegal, it's a lot easier to just either dispose them in the landfills or just dispose them in rivers or lakes or other uh, bodies of water. Um, and there have been so even Supreme Court rulings again and again, kind of like arguing stuff, you know, dumping dead animals, even in like in, in sacred uh, uh, lakes and rivers, and, and they've just like not, not been effective. And and maybe I should like that ties into also like the headline here in the bottom. It's like one of many repeating plays uh, of local authorities saying, look, we really have to stop this practice of leaving dead animals out in the open. We need to build a network of incinerators or we need to find some like other means of disposing of dead animals, but nothing happens. India has essentially one incinerator that's dedicated for livestock animals and it essentially stands uh, almost completely unused because no one even in the vicinity wants to bring the animals to the incinerator. What's nice about having a well-functioning vulture population is they will come to the problem, you don't have to bring the problem to the solution. Um, and although many different uh, times there have been these calls of building a network of incinerators okay. uh, it has just not really happened um, and we've even read it in a report uh, dated I think like from 2022 from the from India's pollution control board and that they have plans to open a second one we haven't seen evidence that they've opened the second incinerator uh, for that as well um, so sorry I want to also like explain a bit about what we're seeing in the two photos above yeah, good to know that. Uh, yeah. So just uh, on the left here, this is like what what one of these animal uh, dump sites or animal landfills looks like. You can see bodies of animals in different stages of composition, and you can see these packs of feral dogs. 
On the right here, you can see this competition between vultures and dogs over a dead animal. You can also see how these dead animals can sometimes find their way into water bodies, which is another kind of like sanitary public health concern. Like we do not want uh, dead animals rotting in uh, bodies of water that might also be a source of drinking water. Um, to tie this a bit more schematically, there are like a lot of moving pieces here. You can think about vultures and, and dogs and rats as like two groups of scavengers competing over the dead animals. So having more of these scavengers is going to mean less of uh, the dead animals, which is good because more dead animals will potentially mean more water pollution, which will have a negative impact on public health. However, if we lose out on vultures, we're going to have more dogs and rats. One problem with having more dogs and rats relative to having more vultures is that vultures don't really come into contact with people. Dogs and rats do. And dogs and rats carry many infectious diseases. Dogs in particular are a massive source or a massive reservoir of rabies. India is in a way sort of this like global epicenter of rabies and animal bites transmit a lot of different infectious diseases. So having more dogs and rats, now that there's less competition over the food supply, would potentially mean more infectious disease spread, yet creating another negative impact on public health. But obviously there are a lot of errors here going in circular directions. This is a hard system to disentangle. What we're effectively doing in this paper is we're going to use this shock that led to high mortality rates and high die-offs of vultures to then look at what, how these mortality shocks that we know affected vultures carried all the way to public health. I think that we'll have time and I'll show you near the end some more kind of like suggestive evidence about these two mechanisms, looking at, looking at both kind of like in evidence for, for rabies and looking at evidence for, for water pollution. Uh, but those would be, I uh, just want to like, you know, to take your expectations, they will be very, very suggestive. We're very cautious also with how, how strongly we're willing to, to interpret them. Um, at a baseline, I have to then kind of like now tell you, well, what exactly is this massive shock to vulture populations? Just important to understand that like before this shock, Vultures were truly everywhere across the sub-Indian uh, continent. This is a photo taken somewhere outside of Delhi, and you see them not only anywhere on the ground, but essentially lining up the top of the rooftops over here in, in the photo. They were just, you know, in the millions throughout the country. No one bothered with ever counting them because they thought, what's the point? They're essentially everywhere. Unfortunately, in the 90s, the population of a species that belongs to the gyps genus uh, declined by 95 to 99% within just a few years. And, and during that time, no one fully understood why. Everyone recognized very quickly that they were declining. And within just like three, four, five years, they went from a very large population size to one that was a mere shadow of its past self. We don't have excellent numbers, you know, we don't have their geolocated um, kind of like data points time after time. We don't know their social networks or anything like that. We have very few repeating surveys that were done in a way that allow us to kind of like see how in just a few years, there was a three orders of magnitude decline in their population levels. Estimates are talking about something like around 30 to 50 millions uh, at baseline that collapsed to just a few thousands, maybe even just a few hundreds that remain in the wild. This happened very quickly and it started kind of like getting noticed in the mid 90s. And by 2000, all of the affected species were listed as critically endangered by the IUCN Red List, sort of like considered as this global source of body of knowledge about how well are different species doing? Critically endangered is essentially one step before you're classified as being extinct in the wild, okay? And after extincting the wild, you might still be in a, in a zoo or a museum or something like, like that. And then it's, uh, it's, then, then it's like basically 
a species is considered extinct. Critically endangered is really the species in the intensive care unit um, in terms of how badly it's doing. And this was not you know, something that we kind of only woke up to after they were completely gone. People understood during that time that they were starting to vanish and they were already speculating that this will be very detrimental to human populations because unlike potentially some other species, vultures have evolved to be so good at what they do that nothing will be able to fill that niche. Or how in the absence of vultures to compete with dogs, there are dogs on the ground, but the skies are empty. So I've told you quite a bit about like just how big and how potentially bad and how quick and sudden this collapse was, but I haven't told you what exactly caused it. What is interesting in this case is that it remained unknown until 2004, okay? From kind of like the time that it started until we actually connected the dots, it took about 10 years until Oaks et al. released their 2004 paper in Nature that was able to provide both kind of like observational and experimental evidence tying this in active ingredient in a piece of medication called diclofenac. Now, you might know this under the brand names of Vorvarin or Voltaren, and uh, you might have used them before as a, as a painkiller. I just want to be perfectly clear, for humans, they're totally safe. You should not be going through your medicine cabinet tonight looking for diclofenac as an active ingredient. Don't throw it out. Very safe to use in humans. We've been using it since the 70s. The problem arose when the patent uh, expired around 93 and the generic pharmaceutical industry in India started producing very you know, potent versions of the drug that were much, much cheaper. They got so cheap that it became economically viable for livestock farmers to start to administer that to, uh, to their livestock as well to help deal with inflammations and fevers and, and just like slightly increase their productivity and make them uh, more docile and easier to manage. And um, little did they know as they were doing that is that that active ingredient is actually lethal to vulture species that belong to the gyps genus. It's enough for a vulture to consume a meat that has even small residue of diclofenac, and they develop kidney failure and die within weeks. It's like almost you know, guaranteed one-time exposure, a small dose, and a death within, uh, within weeks. Once that connection was understood, the Indian government placed a ban on the veterinary use of diclofenac in 2006. It was not a, an effective ban. People kind of like kept using it. And in recent years, there's been an ongoing legal struggle to ban the manufacturing and sale of all forms of diclofenac because you can, you can easily use diclofenac that's supposed to be used in humans and simply give it to your livestock. And it's just, it's so cheap and it's so effective that farmers keep doing it. We don't have any good data on kind of like the variation over space and time in terms of like sales of the drug, but just to kind of like show you that kind of like explosion of availability. And we have data at the national level about prices and volume sold. And we're focusing here on the injectable form of diclofenac because that's the most likely form that was either used or its use was diverted in veterinary cases. And we've essentially normalized um, everything to 1993, the year before the generic approval uh, uh, came about. And we can see how during this time, the price essentially fell down very sharply and, and the, the availability or sale of diclofenac exploded almost by, by a factor of 10. Um, and it's not that it immediately after the generic approval, there was a big explosion. It didn't go from zero to uh, millions of, of uh, units being sold. It's kind of like kept going up over, over time. But even in 1996, reports started to emerge of something's happening out in the wild with vultures. There was one ecologist that went to one of their study sites 
and noticed that about 50% of the vultures were dead. They saw dead vultures in the bushes and the ground and the trees, and they started uh, reaching out to their other colleagues, asking them, oh, they're also noticing something weird happening with vultures. And they all came back and said, yes, but we just thought it's something specific to our site. We didn't realize it's part of a broad pattern. So we kind of like have 96 as the first year, like the first time that really uh, it was very widely observed and recognized that something is wrong with the vulture populations and they were declining. Now, again, we don't have amazing data on where vultures were. We don't have this like repeating panel and of their populations, but we do have different sources of counts throughout the country of these vultures. And here we're normalizing them by the total reports of all other bird species that get reported every year. So we're not like just, you know, it's not that more, more birds are reported every year, which is gonna pull this share down. It's like relative to those birds that get reported all the time, what share do these affected vultures represent? And we see it's pretty stable in the years before uh, the generic approval. And we see a pretty stark decline in the years after. And this is already a pretty upward bias measure. Because once we understand that there's a problem with vultures, it's probably much more likely that people are going out and reporting every time that they see one of those vultures because they've heard that there are problems with that population. But our goal in the paper is to bring this down from the national level to a sub-national level and a sub-state level. To do so, we're going to take the distribution range maps of the habitats to construct a measure of the suitability of a district to these affected vultures. We take these maps from BirdLife International, considered as the global authority about anything related to birds, and we simply take what's the overlap of that habitat with each uh, district for each one of the species. Then we take the mean across those three scores of overlap between habitat and district and assign high or low suitability. This is a somewhat similar approach to how uh, Alsan uh, assigned a suitability uh, using a census suitability score in her 2015 paper. But here we're much less reliant on the exact functional form uh, or for like temperature or for the suitability score itself, meaning it's not so much like are you a percentage point higher or lower in suitability score, we're really trying to separate the areas that are highly suitable and those that are just not highly suitable for those species. And as I mentioned earlier, we're going to add another layer using a data on livestock agriculture from using only data on years before the collapse to also uh, have a measure of high and low livestock agriculture. What we get essentially divides um, India into these four different groups. Either the places that have a high suitability for vultures and have a lot of livestock agriculture or have a lot of suitability but don't have a lot of livestock agriculture or the other two combinations of being high or low on livestock and being low on suitability. Now, what we obviously see is a massive spatial clustering of the high suitability group away from the coastal areas and away from the mountainous areas in the north. But even within this central uh, core of high suitability for the affected species, we have variation in terms of high and low um, high and low uh, livestock suitability. So you can think about like the different comparisons we can make here. We can compare all of the high suitability to all of the low suitability around it. And within each group, we can compare the, in the within the high suitability, we can compare the high livestock to low livestock. And we can also repeat that comparison as a falsification and um, within the low suitability group. So essentially that's what I'll be showing you throughout the rest of the talk. And, and our key outcome is going to use mortality data at the district level as reported by the civil registration system. Now, I don't wanna go into too many details because there are essentially two systems that try to track mortality in, the, in, in India. The civil registration system is the best one to get anything below like a sub-national level. And it's designed to uh, act as uh, the source or develop to become the source of vital statistics data. 
However, there are well-known problems with underreporting in that system. What we need for our study to, to work well is that those problems of reporting are not systematically, systematically correlated with the suitability of vultures and also with the timing of, of their collapse. Even if the baseline levels are um, reported at a lower level than what they really are, we just need the change in levels to be, uh, to be able to derive that, to be able to infer that um, from the data. And in our sample, we're focusing on years after 1988 because there was a shift in the methodology of how uh, uh, those deaths were reported. And we end our sample in 2005, the year before the ineffective, but still uh, 2006 veterinary ban on the sale of diclofenac. What we're doing in this figure here is just a, taking a simple population weighted mean of the all-cause death rates and normalizing it to its level in 1993 for either groups of vulture suitability, the high and the low. And what we're seeing is there's, there's not much of a difference in how they're trending in the years prior to the generic approval and the collapse of, of vultures, but the high suitability districts start to diverge and see an increasing trend in their all-cause mortality and we don't, see, we don't see much of a change in the low suitability. They're essentially just continuing this flat trend uh, as they had in the years prior to that. And I'm probably going to like say this very quickly because I think I've already kind of like told you most of these parts, but like we're thinking about these massive die-offs as a natural experiment that allows us to approximate to some degree an ideal experiment where we would go and randomly manipulate vulture populations. Obviously, that wouldn't work for obvious feasibility and ethical constraints, but what we're getting from these, uh, from these die-offs is these shocks to the sanitation functions that approximates for us going and doing that at random. Um, and we're going to use our classification of high low suitability and high and low uh, baseline agriculture to see how those different districts evolved in terms of their human all cause death rates after vulture populations collapsed. There's nothing fancy or kind of like, you know, frontier in terms of the method here. This is a very simple difference in differences design. We're looking at the all cause death rate and essentially assigning, essentially estimating these betas of the interaction of being in the high vulture suitability group interacted with year dummies while controlling for district fixed effects, zonal council by year fixed effects. You should think of zonal councils as these like broadly administrative regions that don't really matter too much for administration itself, but you have six of those in India. Think of them as something similar to census regions in the US if you've ever worked with them or with like potentially divisions of kind of like north, center and south, you know, east, west uh, in China, kind of like these large agglomerations, but they don't actually have um, a variation in terms of like the, the governing, um, like governing doesn't happen, change necessarily discontinuously. Uh, within them, it's more about like state governance and, and district governance that matters more. But it allows us to capture more like regional time trends. In the paper, we also include results that have uh, different uh, controls for, for weather, both temperature and precipitation. And all of the regressions are always population weighted and we cluster at the district level. Something that we've also done as part of the revisions is uh, obviously uh, think more about like the potential spatial correlation of the standard errors. And we, we've done both kind of like a permutation analysis that's already in the appendix of the paper, but we also now can show you that like if we do something like currently standard errors and assign different thresholds for the potential correlation between the standard errors, if anything, um, the currently standard errors are a bit smaller than the ones that we don't adjust for spatial clustering. And the exact choice of the cutoff just doesn't really matter that much. So if anything, we're not 
underestimating our standard errors here by not uh, accounting for a special clustering, we might be actually like overestimating them, overestimating them by a little. Uh, but the differences really do not seem to to be all that important. Okay. Uh, you want to have a question? Yeah. Yeah, two clarification questions too. Yeah, I, I want to know whether it is computable to to to. It is feasible to compute the high voucher suitability, this index over over time. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. And um, so potentially yes, depending on the underlying data. So in in like. In what we're using in the paper, those maps are pretty static. They they use both habitat suitability modeling techniques in ecology, as well as like expert knowledge and consultations and a bunch of like unpublished records that BirdLife International has access to, to design those maps. And those maps are just like a cross-sectional, you know, we think they're there, we don't think they're there. And in the appendix, we also construct our own version of the suitability score, or like calculate where places that they're more likely to be in using a pretty standard benchmark habitat suitability model known as BioClean. BioClean, you just kind of like fit it a different um, variables about like temperature and precipitation and, and other like climatic uh, forcings that potentially change across seasons. And, and it spits out like a probability. Like the way I like to explain to people, if you kind of like show uh, the model or show them the, the the method, here are polar bears where it's cold, it will then say, okay, I think it's very likely that Alaska uh, is suitable for uh, polar bears, but California not suitable for polar bears. That's what it kind of kind of does. You can then calculate how that suitability score changes over time. If those um, bioclimatic variables, if there's any variation in them over time, for a lot of them, at least over the time ranges that we're thinking about, there's just not enough variation to really change those suitability scores. But over potentially like decades and centuries where there's like potentially a lot of change in land use or like something as violent as like, you know, a volcanic eruption or something like that, those are events that could change the suitability score over time. Yeah. And um, so hopefully that that answers that question. I thought you had another one though as well. So, so this HAVS is based on data in which year? So it's based on so the R classification is used on kind of like the most recent uh, snapshot of the habitat. Okay. Sorry, of the habitat range okay. maps uh, from BirdLife International. Um, and it's a combination of like, you know, many years of data collection on, um, on, on, on different bird species and this like iteration back and forth with like local experts. And, but it's like data from the last 20, 30 years, if you think of something like that. So basically it's actually a lot of pre-treatment, uh, Index. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. It was like these maps were the, the derived and um, mostly based on information like before they collapsed. Um, yeah. Oh, thank you. And, and the second clarification clarification question is: What is the difference between district and area? So you have district by area. Oh, right. Right. Good question. Sorry, I think I forgot to mention this. That the mortality data in some districts is reported for the entire district. Or reported separately for like urban and rural areas. Oh. Now I should say this that like urban and rural areas here are not what you have in mind in terms of like you know Beijing, Shanghai, Paris, London, New York, San Francisco of the world. These are census urban and census rural areas. They mean something very different. They're, the census urban places are simply locations with a population above 5,000 people is like you know just like a slightly large rural area and or a place with a, a share of men working outside of agriculture that's above i think 75 percent or something like that something we're working on as part of the revisions is showing exactly how many of the villages or like places that get classified as as urban under that definition are really still very rural in terms of occupations and size and, and this is also something that like, when we're just starting to work on this project, 
I, I, you know, interpreted urban and rural as like, okay, a city is not going to be affected by a collapse of vultures. It's the rural areas. But uh, my co-author Anant was like, no, 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 you don't, you don't understand what these mean in this setting. The rural areas are just like really small, tiny villages. They're not even going to have an animal uh, landfill. The, all of the dump sites are going to be in these larger villages. It's going to be much more concentrated in the urban areas because of that. Um, so, so in most of the results that I'm going to show you, we're going to be using data at the district level, lumping together both these like census urban and census rural areas. But there will be times where I'll like put a spotlight on the census urban places because uh, that's where we uh, see uh, sometimes like a, a much stronger, sharper effect. That's a, that's a Thank good you. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. That's a good feature of the data. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So our kind of like main headline result in the paper is that when we look at how these human all cause death rates evolve over time, we don't see much of a systematic difference in how they're, uh, it doesn't seem like they're differentially trending over time in the years before the generic approval and collapse. After we know that vultures started to die, we see the high suitability districts diverge from the low suitability districts. And interestingly, by the year 2000, which I remind you, this is when these species were classified as critically endangered, and meaning they've kind of like hit the um, rock bottom, right? The bottom of the barrel, they just know, there's nowhere for them to go any lower in terms of the population size. We see the effect kind of like stabilize and saturate over time. What is also interesting is that we're not really seeing any evidence of defensive expenditures or substitution taking place, at least in, in this time horizon. And, and we're seeing like kind of like on, on average here, additional 0.91 human deaths per 1,000 people. Now, this pattern that we're seeing of kind of like, you know, no pre-trends and then this increase in saturation also survives if we include um, more granular and uh, fine scale time trends by adding state linear time trends or by replacing the zonal council by year time trends with state by year fixed effects. But as we saw in the map, our treatment is very spatially clustered. So adding these more fine scale time controls at the level of the state is already absorbing a lot of the treatment effect that we're interested in. So we're not surprised to see that like the results are dampened, but even when we do, we even run these two uh, versions in this period of the post collapse, when vultures are at their new, you know, collapsed equilibrium, death rates are now about four times, 4% 4 higher relative to the baseline period. And I mentioned also that the, um, the, the data is potentially underreporting the true mortality level. So we're always interpreting our delta in mortality, the increase in mortality relative to a nationally representative uh, mortality mean, which is reported by the uh, UN population division. Um, it's also very similar to the number that the World Bank reports. And that's derived from a different system that's collecting vital statistics data, which is meant, it's only meant to kind of capture a national representative mean. It's not very useful to do anything at a subnational or sub-state uh, level. Um, okay, so one other thing I wanna tell you about is like, okay, how big is a 4% increase in, in mortality? Well, we look at the literature that has looked at sanitation and, and its role in public health. In a lot of those uh, papers, their like, you know, their settings are a bit more of a good story because they're looking at uh, different improvements to different sources of public sanitation, and they find these really big effects, usually looking at infant mortality or children mortality, the potentially the most kind of like a uh, population level, most comparable paper is this one looking at Paris from 1880 to 1914, where there were pretty large and substantial gains in life expectancy when sanitation improved. But by and large, we think that these papers 
you know, bound our uh, estimates such as like a 4% for the entire population is comparable and sensible in a low and middle income country and relative to these impacts on, on children and, and infants. And, or in other words, sanitation in the environment is, is very important for public health. A 4% change on average seems to agree with what a lot of other papers have found in the literature when scaling these estimates up to uh, the rest of the population. But um, as I told you before, it is not enough for uh, vulture populations to collapse. There also needs to be an environmental problem. That environment, environmental problem will be more severe in places where there's a large supply of dead animals to those animal dump sites that then remain out in the open rotting and give rise to a larger population of rats and dogs. So what we're doing here is summarizing these results on, um, on the triple difference design, looking at the triple interaction of a high vulture suitability district and a district that is also at baseline has a high number of livestock animals after the population of vulture uh, collapse. And we see that the results are high, stronger and larger in the, in the districts that meet all of those conditions, especially in that census urban sample um, where there are just like more people and there's a higher likelihood of there being an animal, uh, an animal dead field, uh, sorry, an animal landfill. Um, but we can go even beyond this triple difference and then kind of like decompose it back into two different diffs, okay? So in every triple diff, there are always essentially, a, a, you know, we're always differencing out two uh, different diffs. Let's like look exactly at what they are. Meaning, let's look at this being a high livestock district after the collapse, but only in the high suitability district. So we're essentially, if you remember the map from before, we're looking kind of like the center of the country and are comparing the districts in maroon to the blue districts. And we see that it matters, like being a high livestock district after vulture population collapse is a very good predictor of an increase in, um, um, in, in human death rates. However, it has almost no effect if you're a low suitability district. In other words, if you don't have a lot of livestock or you do have a lot of livestock, it's not gonna really matter if you're at a place that didn't really experience the collapse because you're a low, su low suitability district. You didn't have a lot of those uh, vultures to begin with. Um, so that and we thought was like compelling and important to kind of like show that like the effect really is observed exactly where kind of like the ecological theory suggests that it would be um, and this falsification of like if vultures collapse in the country but you're a place that didn't have vultures to begin with you really should not be uh, affected by it and that's and that's what we see and um, i you know i haven't shown you any or said much about like how different those districts of high suitability and low suitability is were baseline and because it's not a key feature or necessary condition for the identification strategy, but we think it is a bit useful to think about those differences. And in the paper, we include many more outcomes. And while there is already somewhat of a difference in, the, in terms of scale between the low suitability and the high suitability in terms of the death rates, there's not much of a difference on average in terms of the size of the livestock sector. There's clearly some difference in weather and climatology, which would predict also differences in suitability. But what we think is even more interesting is that we don't really see at baseline a difference in, in the direction uh, in terms of healthcare access and infrastructure that would explain why these high suitability districts are going to see worse conditions in the future. But with the data from the census in 91, we can do even more and go and see what happened in the census in 2001. Through these like long list of different outcomes that might potentially uh, offer an alternative explanation as to why vulture populations declined in those regions, we don't see much 
uh, we don't see any meaningful changes, definitely not in terms of precision or in terms of magnitude relative to what their means are. If anything, we're interpreting a lot of these results here as pretty precise zero effects. We're not seeing healthcare infrastructure or healthcare personnel or employment shares or village infrastructure as offering a kind of like a compelling alternative explanation as somehow systematically changing with the collapse of uh, vultures in these high suitability districts. Um, so we are like, you know, there's always like with a different diff, like a lot of other things can change, but at least the things that we can measure pre-collapse and post-collapse around the, around the kind of like variety of outcomes, we don't see much, uh, much of a change there. And I wanna get into just the mechanisms quickly and then I'll, I'll wrap up. So, we're back at the national level, which is unfortunately the best that we think that we can do with this. From the similar source that we have, this data on the sales of diclofenac, we also have data on the sales of a rabies vaccine. Now, I hope you never uh, uh, got an, like a wild animal bite you that then necessitated getting like treated for potential rabies exposure, but you should know that if that does happen, the first thing you're going to get is a shot of the rabies vaccine. It's like you're going to get a series of three shots. One of them, the first one is going to be the vaccine. You're going to get that immediately. And, and what we're seeing is that those sales, you know, if we think about what the trend draws from 91 to, to 96, if we just continued with the trend, trend, we should have been at like about, um, you know, that level of, of sales, where we're seeing this like break from the trend around the time that we see all of these other results of like vultures collapsing, death rates increasing, and so on. We also don't have a panel of feral dogs, but surprisingly from 2012, we do have counts of feral dog populations as part of the livestock census. This was the first year that they uh, really collected uh, precise data or like, you know, well-measured data on those dog populations. And we see this correlation that places that had a larger collapse because they had more suitability for those vultures and this like cross-sectional correlation between that baseline suitability and degree of collapse with the counts of, uh, of, of feral dogs. This all also, uh, you know, corresponds with a back of the envelope calculation by this paper uh, by Markandi et al. from 2008. They just, you know, based on caloric requirements, uh, said that like for every 10 million vultures that you lose, there's an increase in food supply that can support about 7 million dogs. And we're talking about a loss of like 30 to 50 million vultures, give, give or take. You know, so multiply that you're on a range of like 21, 35 million additional dogs across the country. And that plays also with the anecdotal reports from many of these uh, villages that people were just afraid to walk outside because there were packs of feral dogs kind of like, you know, tormenting them and potentially attacking their, their children. I also told you about a channel of water quality. For water quality, we have subnational data on like rabies vaccines, but I should also, you know, caution you when interpreting this as the water quality in data in India, especially for our sample period, is very imperfect. The monitoring stations are very imbalanced, even at the district level, and we don't get the same necessarily time series of measurement. Like sometimes we get a measurement from like a well or a lake or a river. Most of the measurements are from rivers, and but we have an imperfect a panel of, of reporting, kind of like entry, a lot of entry and exit of different monitoring stations. And we also know that over time, as they added more monitoring stations, they tended to add them across the country in the cleaner places to kind of like make the statistics uh, look a little better. But what we should expect to see with there being more dead, dead animals out in the environment is seeing a reduction in dissolved oxygen and we see that especially in the uh, census urban regions of the district. And we should expect to see an increase in fecal coliforms 
and we see a massive increase as well. Now, this is a really, really big change in uh, fecal coliforms, uh, which might be you know, hard to rationalize, but it's important to understand that the baseline distribution of fecal coliforms in India is huge. And so this like even year to year variation in fecal coliforms, uh, you know, this is not an outlier uh, increase. Like it can change by, by that much. In the appendix, we also look at three other outcomes, such as the uh, biological oxygen demand, chemical oxygen demand, and uh, turbidity. And they all somewhat imprecisely, uh, but go in the same direction as we would expect them to go in, in, these, in these locations, uh, and they de deteriorate uh, as well. Um, so we run like additional other tests, like losing lung differences to use more districts, even if they're unbalanced. We extend the sample to start all the way in 1981, and we still don't observe pretrends. As I mentioned earlier, we construct our own suitability score where we know exactly what's going into the machinery, and it's less of a black box like the maps we get from BirdLife International. We obtain very similar results. We rule out that there's like a single outlier district or outlier state by running a variety of lib one out regressions. And we also look at permutation inference and now also Conley in uh, standard errors to think about spatial clustering of the standard errors. To conclude, what we find is that in uh, the time after vulture populations collapsed suddenly, abruptly, and unexpectedly in India, we see about a 4% increase in all cause human uh, death rates. This is a, relative to a nationally representative mean. Of, of mortality. If we use an India-specific uh, mortality reduction value or value of statistical life, depending on how we prefer to call it, um, we assign roughly $70 billion in damages a, a year, which suggests that there should be a campaign to restore vulture populations, especially how we have said nothing about morbidity uh, or the cultural role that vultures have in burial rights. But recovering vultures will take a long time because they take five years to reach maturity and they only have one offspring a year. What is also important here is even though we can substitute for them, it is highly in costly and intensive in terms of capital and labor. We're not burying the animals because it is privately costly. We're not building incinerators because it's expensive. And while there are more programs to vaccinate rabid feral dogs for, for rabies, those are expensive and they have to be repeated year after year. In short, substituting keystone species can be prohibitively expensive. It might be better to not lose them at the first stage at all. And I hope that we have you know, updated positively on vultures, but also know that uh, now a bit more about how keystone species can have a role on human well-being. Thank you so much for your time and I'm happy to stick around if anyone has uh, other questions or comments. Oh, uh, good timing, and thank you very much for your, for your presentation. And thank yeah, let's gather, yeah, for our audience, any questions? From our audience? Yeah, maybe I have go, go for it. two questions. The first question I want to know is, I, I see you have some, like, different outcomes test. I, I'm wondering whether you have tests on, like, population or migration behaviors that mm -hmm. make matters on the the deaths because um, like, people are just left away to avoid some yeah yeah um so i don't think i know that like in recent years there's much better data on migration um We've thought about at some point using the DHS, which is an imperfect database to try and look at migration. But the problem with India and the DHS, that I think that the first geocoded data set is from 2005. So it's like way after like our uh, sample. Um, so in short, we don't have good data on migration. We can look at total like population sizes and infer something from that. But that's also a uh, really imperfect. And I guess that the main concern there with migration would be that the like 
if it's the case that like the kind of like exposed populations are uh, migrating away um, from the most affected places, if it's the case that it is like the, we're getting a truncated distribution of like the strongest, most capable, healthiest populations moving away, and then maybe we're just picking up an effect of like the districts remain with more kind of like weak and feeble uh, populations. Is, is that the, the concern? Um, we've thought about that. We don't have um, we don't have a good way to address that during the time sample of the period. We've definitely not seen anything anecdotally to suggest that there were like migration waves in response to that uh, to that environment decline. Um, but it's it's a it's a good question and it's one that we have tried to come up with something uh, to do with the data we have and we just don't have good data for that time period. Yeah, because sometimes because in your story the decrease in the vultures will increase the number of carrions, right? And then, right. yes, yeah, so people might just hate the environment and then so 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 my following question is so there are three. Uh, things in your model actually like like the number of carrion and number of vultures and the, the 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 house and so to extreme case i would say if there is no carrion so no food for vulture mm -hmm. but good for health right so to an extreme like no carrion no vulture but good for health so how to actually correctly understand the relationship between them. So, so in this case, you will see a decrease in number of vultures, but the, the health is getting increased. If we're not sure, so maybe this gets to that. Like, so here are places that you know don't have zero livestock, but they have a much smaller, you know, the sorry, the livestock dummy here is for the places that have a lot of livestock relative to having not a lot of livestock. But these are the places, or I should say, like these are the places that really didn't see a change in their vulture populations. And so you're right that, like, you know, without having those vulture populations or without having the species that were affected by, by the collapse, and it's like it's not, I think what you're saying is like that having no livestock and might be might be better for health because there won't be like dead animals in the environment. I think that's true. That's right. um, but um it's, I think this table can 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 answer my question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I got it. What, what are we saying here is that we're not really seeing whether like the places with or without livestock are doing worse or better. We're just seeing that they're not doing differentially worse or better after the collapse. In the places they didn't have a lot, didn't have a lot of vultures. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. These are my. Yeah. Thank you so much for for your. Uh, uh, oh, I, I find there is one question from. Oh yeah, let me read that quickly. Yeah. Um, oh, how the number of dogs increases. And um, so let me go back to. One of the photos. Uh, here we go. So essentially, you should think about the dogs and the vultures as competing over the food source. If something shows up and just kills all of the vultures, there's a lot more food availability for the dogs. And based on that back of the envelope calculation, you know, if you trust all of the somewhat heroic assumptions there, but in terms of just orders of magnitude, Think about like, you know, for every, you know, every 10 vultures you lose, there's more enough food now to support seven more dogs. So that um, kind of like, think of it in a way of like increasing the budget constraint uh, for dogs and you can get a lot more of them because there's a lot more food for them. There wasn't anything intentional. People didn't like feed them more or like people didn't adopt more dogs then, which was part of the problem because the increase was in these like, packs of feral dogs that at times can also attack people, especially young children uh, out, out in India. And a lot of them have rabies. And so that, that that's the connection. Hopefully that, that answered that question. Um, is it common to use dogs to 
deal with. So it's not that, um, it's not that, you know, I should say, I should say this, um, it's not that it's common to use vultures or common to use dogs. It's just that that's the environment or that's like the uh, interactions in that ecosystem that either vultures or dogs or rats will take care of dead animals. Um, and it was just like beneficial for people when it was when it was more reliant on vultures than it was on dogs, because dogs are not as effective as vultures. They don't actually eat a dead animal down to the bone. There's a lot of like rotting flesh that remains behind. But also dogs will come into contact with people and spread infectious diseases and vultures won't. They're like, they'll stay away and respect your personal space. And so it's it's not so much about like the choice of the technology, but it's like kind of like what's the technological endowment that your environment has in a way. Right. And I think we're over time. So like if anyone has to jump on a different Zoom call or go get that coffee, because it's still early in the morning for you, feel free. But if anyone wants to just like stick around and chat for a few more minutes, I'm happy to. Yeah, yeah. maybe let me close. So yeah. So 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 thank you very much for, for Frank to for, for uh, to join us today. And that's very nice research. I would say that it's really fresh and fantastic to to our traditional, I would say like traditional economists or empirical guys in, in in doing either environment or, or health is quite a great and a new perspective. And let's forward to your like more research regarding this biodiversity issues. And for our audience, uh, this, this may be our last semester for our joint uh, joint uh, joint seminar between the PKU and Stanford. So thank you all for, for joining today. Yeah, and thank you. Professor Frank. And thank you all for having me and thank you all for taking the time to come in here and learn more about my work. I really appreciate it. Have okay. a great rest of your day and great rest of your week. Okay. Bye Have everyone. Bye-bye.